Welcome to Love You a Brunch, the podcast for foodies and those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. So we are speaking to Christina Ward today. She is a writer, an editor, a teacher, and a publicist. Uh, she is the author of Preservation, the Art and Science of Canning, Fermentation, and Dehydration. And her new book that we're going to be talking about today is American Advertising Cookbooks, How Corporations Taught Us to Love Bananas, Spam, and Jello. Hi, welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. I love reading this book. Um, it kind of puts together all of my loves, history, food, and actually a little bit of self and cultural awareness in there as well. Well, thank you so much. I, I think... Uh, the reason for me writing it was I share those interests as well. And my, I suspected that a lot of other uh, people who grew up in the 60s, 70s, even 80s um, have an interest in the history now as we become more aware of what, what we eat. Um, it's always that nagging question of like, how did we get here? How did it get this way? Right, exactly. Um, and, you know, we see those advertisements all the time on social media. People post them because they're funny to look at now. Um, some of them very racial, um, not politically correct. A, a lot are very anti-feminism. And, um, of course, uh, all of the jello and weird things like that that we see and we, we think, who was thinking that was a good idea to eat? And <laughs> why did our parents actually purchase this stuff but I'm looking through your book and it's funny because I recognize some of the recipes and cookbooks that I had in my house growing up that I saw at my grandparents house and my husband's mother seems to make a lot of the recipes and things that are coming out from all these advertising cookbooks as well so it was kind of funny to see that and see where it came from you, my husband too shares a love of that era of comfort food because again, his grandma uh, was there like kind of chief cook and bottle washer at when he grew up and she too had all of those cookbooks as so many people did. It was such a successful marketing tool for all of the food companies and the food manufacturers to publish cookbooks to help teach people how to use the products. That was a revolutionary idea. And one we feel uh, we still see today because of, you know, that idea of like, we have a nostalgia towards the comfort foods. And a lot of these comfort foods are born out of these cookbooks. Funnily enough is uh, I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I work, I do some writing for Nancy Stowes, who's the fabulous food editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And she was doing a small research project that, turned up an interesting fact, which is she was looking to find what was the oldest family recipes, asking readers to send in copies of their oldest family recipe that got handed down. And what she found was most of those recipes were actually generated. I mean, 99% had their origination in some sort of advertising cookbook. Right. You know, and that's funny because I was I was speaking with my grandmother who I'm in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but my my father's mother comes from Appalachia, Southern Virginia, so mountain, you know, cooking. And so I said, hey, maybe we could do something with the podcast where you're showing something from your family, how you guys used to cook, something that you're really known for. And one of the things she said was banana pudding. And I thought... That is the strangest thing. I never would think banana pudding. And then reading this book, I'm going, okay, now I see. She must have had one of those books, especially I think it was like 1940, 41, uh, according to your book, mm -hmm. um, that the banana uh, cookbook came out. And it makes total sense to me now. That was probably around the time she was getting married or, you know, whatever. And that would have been something where, you know, she tried it for the first time and everybody was like, wow, that's so great. And banana, you know, it was just a cool thing to put together. It's funny because I think what we can, you know, we're living in what it's going to be 2020 in just a year um, that time moves forward. And sometimes our cultural memory is short. And my grandmother lived on a very rural Wisconsin farm. And up until like the 70s, cooked, you know, with a very old wood stove, actually. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think that technology plays a huge part in how we cooked. And that was a great, that convergence with those advertising cookbooks because there was this great change. And so beyond like, say your grandmother's story of like becoming a new housewife and you learn how to, to kind of become domestic as well as women who were, of course, the primary cooks in their household, had to learn not just how to feed their families, but also deal with all this new technology that they were uh, being introduced to by advertising and marketing. So something like a gas stove, an electric stove, was a different way to cook than what you may have grown up with, saying using wood cooking. Right. Um, so that became like a huge opportunity for advertisers to like create these new recipes, these new ideas that would use the foods that they were working to promote. Yeah. Um, and it was also very interesting, of course, to and I think we all know this, but to see it in writing and to read it, um, it really hit home where. You know, they were the marketing people were very smart. They they hit on all of those self-conscious behaviors of people of not being a good enough wife, a good enough mother, um, high enough class, and were able to really get their products into people's homes with that mentality. They were really ruthless in how they exploited uh, the idea of American culture. And I think one of the, the ideas to take away for for today is there are rules about advertising now that were put in place after this kind of golden age in the mid-century, but those advertisers are still working overtime today yeah. to try to get us to behave in a way that satisfies their marketing needs. So I think that's the lesson to always take away is that whether it's the ridiculous little videos that you may see on social media of like the, I, I, I'm always appalled. If you see those videos of just the most atrocious kind of snack foods, like the pizza stuffed with the hamburger mm. with hot dogs. It just, and so it appeals to almost a ridiculousness, but yet people are always thinking then about pizza and hot dogs and hamburgers. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Successful advertising ploy. Uh, but I think that, you know, we, we need to always be on guard a little bit about who's trying to sell us something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it your book just doesn't just encompass those advertising. It really does go through the history of American food and the cultural and how it connected with politic, you know, politics and how it just encompassed everything about America at that time. Well, I did it that way. And again, it's, there are some really wonderful food histories, really academic studies that have been done um, that if people are interested, they should really take a look at for further study. But my goal was to try to tell the story from that 10,000 foot level to bring in all of those elements, because you can't tell that story of modern American food without bringing in all of those different factors of the culture at the time, the politics at the time, um, and the technology and just how I think it was just a really interesting time that early, early 20th century, because it was a strange convergence of all of those different elements coming together that had a, a tremendous effect on again, the food we eat still to, to this day. Yeah. Um, such an interesting book. Um, so tell us a little bit, the, there's a whole section on bananas. So tell us a little bit about um, how did bananas get into this country? Well, bananas are very much a product of, you know, colonialism. I mean, to not put too fine a point on it. Um, as the, in, say, post-Civil War era, there was the great expansion and building boom from the United States through Central and South America. And a lot of entrepreneurs were looking specifically for ways to shorten that route, the shipping route, um, that post-Civil War era, even before then, to ship a product, any product, to even people from New York to San Francisco, you actually had to go around the tip of South America. And that was the birth of the Panama Canal. And as that scramble to try to build and develop Central and South America, bananas came along. And how they did is, um, 
as the workers were building railroads, uh, they brought with them bananas because they were easy to grow. They're a monolithic kind of crop, meaning that they're not really natural producers. You have to cultivate them. They're tubers. And so Jesuits had brought them from um, Africa to the Caribbean in the 15 and 1600s, and then they migrated to uh, Central and South America with workers. And w the funny thing is, accidentally, as they're building the railroads through Costa Rica, which the Atlantic side is, the terrain is quite unfriendly to humans. Um, they found that they had greater success growing bananas than building railroads. Right, and that's so, crazy. <laughs> yeah, and so a couple entrepreneurs, they start shipping the bananas. It's that great kind of that American capitalist spirit to say, I can't send an empty boat to New Orleans to get supplies that I need to build my railroad. I'm going to fill it up with bananas and see what happens. Yeah. And that introduction happened from there as people decided that these were good. These were nutritious um, and kind of tasty. But modern bananas are much sweeter than they were in the late 1800s. But that's how it got started. And then it just took a few very ambitious and smart businessmen who were food doing essentially food commodity brokers along the eastern seaboard to try to bring those bananas to consumers. And that's kind of the story of how they got started here in the United States. It used to be a rare delicacy. And now we think of it as, you know, almost an un-American food. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's always bananas sitting on the counter. Something someone can grab if they want to snack on, you know, something before dinner or take with them for breakfast. So it's it's crazy to think that they have not been here forever. Yeah, we, we see this a bit more, too, in uh, the modern era of avocados. Yeah. When grow, if you grew up in the 70s and then maybe early 80s, especially if you're a Midwesterner, an avocado was a rare and exotic thing. And now every supermarket in the country has got, you know, bags of avocados, four for five dollars. Right. So it's become like a very American food. And the reason for that is marketing. Um, you know, people looking to sell and, and create new food markets have done a really good job of introducing them to the country. What is a little interesting is to see where the commonality is. If one of the marketing tools for bananas was to tout the health values, that this was a healthy food. And some of the early marketing from the 30s even about bananas was the recommendation, quote unquote, recommendation from doctors who were then paid by the uh, United Fruit Company to say that you to recommend eating a banana a day. Yeah. <laughs> which which is, you know, great dubious medical advice, but people followed it. They wanted to uh be healthy and do the best and that as you mentioned earlier, that kind of guilt trip for women especially to be the best moms they could. And so if that meant giving your kid a banana every day, that's what they did. Right. Right. And um just reminded me when you brought about the bananas, you know, one a day. Also the grapefruit diet. I found that interesting as well that, you know, that comes back every cup, you know, every generation, there's always that grapefruit diet that they're recommending. And that's like a, a you know, it's very controlled by marketing. It very much is. And that's why you see, I think it's really interesting. One of the diets that is in kind of rising in popularity right now is the, what they're calling the keto diet. Yes. If, which is gaining in popularity, also has its genesis in the 1930s, where the recommendation was to reduce all carbohydrates and just essentially subsist on proteins. Um, and again, we have to be careful with those because marketer, marketers really pick up on those fads. And so you see there's actually, I think there's one modern um, marketing kind of, they're doing some recipes from the American beef council mm. because, you know, why not? Yeah. Why not take advantage of what the current trend is? Right. And I, I mean, I admit I, I try hard to do the keto diet. I never seem to succeed, but I try hard. But when you really think about it, you know, the, what was it? The late eighties, early nineties with the whole, um, beef industry issue where people were not eating beef. 
and they were worried about mad cow disease. And now all of a sudden, that's all we want to eat. Uh, right. I think it's always really interesting. And again, not to knock any of the actual medical benefits of some restrictive diets. There are definitely, and this goes into, again, that modern science of food, there are many more food allergies among Americans than there were a um, hundred years ago. And that's a combination of we're less connected to our food. Our gut biomes have changed over the years uh, because of our, we're, we have less bi uh, bacteria in our guts than we did, than our grandparents did. And part of that is that change from r rural to urban environments that all has an effect. So a lot of these modern restrictive diets can be health, beneficial to folks' health. But I always want to caution people to lay eyes wide open and make sure that they're responding to something that feels good for their health and their body and not just taking advantage of kind of some marketing information. Yeah. Yeah. Smart. So we seem to have in this country a fascination with gelatin. Not nearly as much as we did in the 80s <laughs> or the 70s and earlier, because some of the things that get posted on social media with the recipes, to me, seem so crazy. But what is that fascination from? Gelatins actually had, in the from the medieval times, had a very important um, role in food preservation, actually. So the idea of food preservation, sometimes we think of, uh, you know, a bag of a, a Twinkie that can last for 100 years. Hmm. But if you think back to the, you know, primitive eras uh, prior to like kind of mechanization, is even the ability to make your food last a couple days longer than if it was fresh meant you were going to eat another day and kind of ward off starvation. And so a lot of food preservation techniques are are really based in just keeping the food for a couple extra days. So removing any oxygen, exposure of oxygen, is a way to help preserve the food. And so that's my long explanation to get to why gelatins were so popular. So a gelatin, an aspect, is essentially a barrier to oxygen. And so if you encase a food inside a gelatin, it prevents oxygen from getting to it and it prevents that food from rotting. So that's the origination of kind of foods encased in jello. And as time moves on, the jello, the, the product itself kind of morphed and changed and it was always a savory dish. Um, and it became in the, again, the, the turn of this 19th century or 18th, 20th century, a sweet dish with that ad addition where sugar became cheap and available. And we as humans love mm -hmm. sugar. We For respond, sure. our brains light up with sugar. And so adding sweetness to a gelatin, and that was just a magical thing to happen to our, our food culture because we responded really well to something that was cheap, sweet, and um, tasted pretty good. Yeah. And that's how that got started. Yes. And then, of course, the jello molds help with that because it makes it pretty and, you know, it can be a centerpiece on your table. Sure. And that actually has um, great roots to, to Renaissance. It was always, it com comes back to class. Um, a great display of wealth is showing off the skills of, of your very fancy cook. And so different, you know, aristocrats were in competition with each other to come up with the most over-the-top displays. If you think about, um, you know, I, I do like, you know, Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette just for the visual beauty of it. So if you've seen that movie and you see like the decor and the costumes and the hair, um, they didn't just eat, you know, a, a, a raw hunk of like chicken or something the food followed the fashion as well hmm. and so we have that uh, fascination and that kind of kept going throughout history um so when we get to that 20th century we're still using that like kind of renaissance era display of making something beautiful by using molds and that artful color arrangement in um in some of those jello molds that you kind of saw from throughout the 70s yeah 
it, it's an amazing book. Um, I, I love, Thank you. I love looking through it. I love the, like I said, the historical aspect and there's so much education and I, I, I just, I love it. I hope that everybody goes out and reads it. What made you, what made you choose this uh, to write about after doing your preservation? Well, as I was saying a little bit, there, there is some historical preservation aspects of it. And I'm, I'm, I love history. I love the dark little kind of rabbit holes of history. And um, as you, you mentioned earlier in the introduction, I do work in, in publishing and my, my boss, Adam Parfrey, um, he, like so many of us, loved the, those internet images of like those disgusting jello molds <laughs> and the meat yeah. salads and just those over the top stuff. And because of my, you know, my background in the food history, um, we'd have these ongoing arguments about, you know, I'm like, well, it's more than just a crazy picture. There's more there. And so he got tired of hearing me shout about that. <laughs> So he told me to just write write a book about it, which is I happily did. Right. Well, I'm glad you did. It's I'm I enjoy even just going through without reading it, just looking at all of the different advertisements, and it's amazing that people saw Jello and mayo and all of the things in the way that they do because I think nowadays, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think our we've gotten a little more sophisticated. In our food preparation, and so looking back at this, it, it to me is is just it's iconic. Well, thank you. Um, and I think that the, the book does have a lot of those images. I think you you can write about it, but you have to show the images to really truly tell the story. Yeah. Uh, so it's a combination of that. And I one thing it's I find it really interesting. Um, we have changed how we eat today. And one of the things that's changing and I find really interesting is that we're actually cooking foods less than we used to. Yeah. So we're eating a lot more like undercooked and, and, and I don't mean this always in meats, but like lesser cooked raw vegan, you know, items. And what's funny about that is there's a correlation um, between that and all of the uh, food safety, the food outbreaks, because at its basic, why people started cooking, adding heat to food in the first place was to kill off all the pathogens. Right. <laughs> and so we've come full circle in the, the less we cook our food, the more uh, susceptible we are to foodborne pathogens. So everybody either cook your food or, or know your sources Buy 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 from locally grown purveyors. That's my, that's my food safety hat on for okay. a moment. <laughs> Great. <laughs> now, and yeah, I do also, I feel like t today we're kind of going back to before um, maybe our grandparents, our great grandparents era where everything, you didn't have the processed foods as much. I, th I feel like, um, the generations today are really trying to get away from the processed foods that we had and we loved in the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I agree with you, and I think that's a good thing. Oh, I yeah. Do I do think that we also have to educate ourselves a little bit and understand why, how things got to be the way they are. That And that's my, my approach to teaching as well as writing, because that makes us more educated um, consumers. It makes us better eaters if we know how things got to be the way they are. Absolutely. And I, and I love that about the book, how you explain about how Crisco was created and um, how um, margarine and things like that. Whereas, you know, growing up in the 80s for myself, margarine was always on the table. Crisco was used for everything. Um, and it, made, it makes complete sense. So I, I loved reading this. So thank you so much for that. Oh, gosh, thank you. Um, and again, anytime uh, that we you ever have a question, anyone has a question about where their food came from, you know, it, it pays to do just a little bit of research because the story that's told is often one that's told by advertising. And so we want to get away from letting uh, the advertisers tell us what we should eat. <laughs> right, right. And, and I did, uh, also I want to bring up the, aspect of the mascots of all the brands, how, how they went from being, oh, completely stereotypical racist images to where we are today. 
on some of, you know, those those same characters have morphed into more politically correct images today. Yes, but their their roots, of course, are in this blatant um, kind of racist imagery. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting. And this is not a resolved issue no. uh, because one, we see it pop up sometime and, and it stands out is like egregious when we see uh, a misstep by advertisers who either um, promote something so sexist or racist. And we, we recognize that better now, but the more subtle kind of coded images and coded messages, we are, we, we still have problems um, identifying those. And that's something that we're going, we as a culture will have to, to deal with and have to reconcile for ourselves because sometimes these mascots become beloved mm. and they become then adopted by the community they once parodied. And so I think it's always up to the communities, say, you know, we look at a, an Aunt Jemima kind of character. Um, I, I defer to the com communities of color, to people of color to say, to, to lead the way as to how we should view these um, formerly overtly racist mascots right. for the future. Right. Um, and that's so um, important at this point, especially like right now. Now we're recording this right before the holidays and we've been having a lot of in the last like week or so. We have the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which was a beloved, um, you know, animation holiday film from the early 50s where they're saying the bullying and um, they're saying that should be banned. And then there's a uh, baby it's cold outside, which has been getting a lot of um advertisement lately about whether it should be appropriate or whether it should be banned. So it really is, it shows you how the culture is changing. Yeah. And in that turn, personally, I am against, you know, outright banning things. I'm looking, I always look at things as an opportunity to educate ourselves, to say, where did we come from? How did this occur? How did we get there? And and how can we move forward? I, I don't, I don't think it serves our culture to ignore what we were, you know, what we responded to, what we thought appropriate in the past, which is again, another reason to, for me to put this book together was we need to acknowledge what, what our grandparents and what our parents and even what we as kids were exposed to and, and how we reacted and, and how we developed our own sense of, of kind of culture and morality based on, you know, the images that were fed to us. Absolutely. Um, because if we forget about it, it's going to just go back to that. I agree a hundred percent with that. Yeah. Yes. Um, again, thank you so much for this book. Um, but I do want to also hit on your preservation because you are really well known for your pickles and your preserving and of foods. And I love that as well. Um, I haven't been able to do it as much as I used to, um, but I'm hoping to get back into it now that my daughter's getting older. Um, but how did you get started in that? Well, I mentioned earlier my grandmother, and it was my, my father's mom, my grandma, and I loved her dearly, and she lived on this very rural, um, you know, kind of, and even in the 70s and 80s, it was rural. I mean, she kind of rejected modernity. Mm. But one of the things that she did was, of course, food preservation. Uh, she never drove a car, and she was 10 miles to the closest town. She relied on, like, neighbors if she needed a ride somewhere. And so that was a really critical thing. You needed to preserve food. You needed to make sure that you were going to be able to get through the winter. And so it took on, for her, food preservation was a life-sustaining skill. Yeah. She needed to do. There was no choice in the matter. Um, and I spent my summers with her, and I loved her dearly. And I took to, as all of us cousins would help out on the farm during the summer, I took most to, like, helping her with her, like, the kitchen garden, the old, you know, acre garden that was going to sustain your family and the preservation. And so that's why I learned, you know, just the basics and then always kept up with it and then later learned that the skills um, that she utilized were – most current in probably the 1800s and not safety appropriate yeah, <laughs> to the true. modern era. <laughs> and so that, that kind of set me off on, on that journey to like learn the history and learn more and work with the state of Wisconsin 
Um, and most of the ma major Midwestern states have this is with their extension service, which was about providing the latest and greatest scientific information um, on many aspects of rural culture, from soil sampling to gardening to food preservation. And so I'm the actually certified master food preserver for Ooh. my county. And that actually kind of fans out to the four county area. And so though I'm an urban county with the resurgence of urban agriculture, it's been a boon to and a, a great joy for me. I still teach um, and I love bringing people together to give them a little bit of the history. And then that great community feeling of like, we're all working together to make sauerkraut or right. we're all working together to make jam. Yeah. And so what did you say you are? You're the master food preservation? Master food preserver. preserver. Yes. That, oh, okay. Isn't that great? That's, that's <laughs> an old archaic title from the, from the 1800s of wow. when, the, when the extension services started. It was, they called it the master. And it, some folks might be more familiar with the term master gardener. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's akin, it's related to that same program. So, but yes, I get to say master food preserver. Wow. Yes. Very, very impressive. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I never even thought master gardener was anything for real. I thought it was just, yeah, I like to garden. I'm really good at it. Call me the master gardener. <laughs> no, no, it's not, you know, and that's one of those, uh, those things as goofy as, as that sounds, it is not a self-appointed title. Yeah. Um, and so even the master gardeners go through training through the uni their universities. Um, and so there, it's a great resource if you, you know, if anybody has got um, problems with their, their gardens at home or their house plants, whatever. If you call your university extension service, they will have a volunteer and that's part of the program. It's a volunteer program. They will have a volunteer community member. Um, they'll usually give you a phone number and someone in your area you can talk to who can answer questions about why your ficus is turning brown or you, people call me all the time, you know, why your jelly didn't set and why your, why your pickles went mushy. Well, well, okay, let's go there then. My pickles sure. are never crisp. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Well, I can drill down. Let's do a quick troubleshoot here. Okay. So are you doing fermented like crock pickles or are you doing canned vinegar so pickling solution pickles? Canned vinegar. Okay. So a couple of the, here's some of the basic things that will happen will that will result in mushy pickles. So we run through your, your checklist here. You want to use the freshest cucumbers you can. It makes a, a couple days makes a difference. So if you're going to do a canning project, definitely work with your, your local farmer's market and get those pickles, you know, get those pickling cukes in your hands as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is a lot of folks, the, the, what they call the stem end or the flower end mm -hmm. the, where, where the flower grew to make the actual cucumber, there is an enzyme deposit. As soon as that cucumber is picked, that enzyme starts to degrade the cucumber. So you have to cut that off or scrape it off. And you'll look, because if you look at a cucumber, there's the stem side, it has a little pokey yeah. out, but that other side has a small indentation. You gotta get rid of that. That will cause mushy pickles. Really? So if you're not, yep, if you're not doing that, your pickles are gonna go a little mushier. The other, th uh, thing that I've encountered is people get excited and they pour hot pickling solution over their um, cucumbers. And when you're processing cucumbers that you're cooking them. Right. So processed cucumbers are never going to be as crisp as say like the Vlasic yeah. style. Yeah. So, you know, but you can get them crisper by making your pickling solution, letting it cool down first and then pouring it over your jars of the cucumbers and, and it doesn't be cold, but just let it cool down. Uh, you want to, you know, prevent them that pickling solution from cooking your cucumbers right away. I mean, de facto, they're going to cook. Yeah. That's what, when you're in the processor, that's what happens. So, but those, those three things fresh, get rid of that enzyme from the flower end and let your pickling solution cool down. Those three things will help you get to crunchier pickles. Okay. Um, and what can, I do, what can I do with the pickles that I have that my children won't eat because they're not like the Vlasic pickles? <laughs> oh, see, now now you have to do some education and training and just make them eat those pickles. <laughs> um, 
Um, but part of it is sometimes, you know, you can use them in cooking depending on how many you have. Um, one of the great tricks is just if you chopping up a frat, uh, in, in your canned pickles, chopping up a few pickles to mix into um, a meatloaf or a hamburger if you're making that, mm. um, you know, adds yeah. a it adds a, like a really nice little flavor booster to that. Um, otherwise the, the perfect solution to all pickle problems are bloody Marys. <laughs> <laughs> if you put it in a bloody Mary, nobody really cares how soft. It there is. you go. There you go. Now I, I, I have this... that's good for children though. So. Uh, yeah, right. Right. I have the same problem when I have made pickle, uh, pickled peppers and they, they are also not as crisp. Is it, maybe it's, maybe I'm putting in the, the, water and vinegar when it's too hot. Yeah, I would let it cool down. And also it's about managing that expectation. Again, you know, processed pickled anything is going to be just softer than a crock or refrigerator pickle. Yeah. So, it, you know, and that's, we, I encounter that all the time because it, it people will, will want that kind of classic mm -hmm. crunch, mm -hmm. but you're just not going to get that if you're processing. Yeah. Now, how are they getting it that crisp? Um, well, and again, that's a non, it's a different type of pickle. Um, so the, there's a couple different styles. So you talk about like a process, a process is like vinegar solution and then canned, and you can do a same vinegar solution just like that and put it in a crock or, you know, a food safe bucket. Let that essentially ferment for a few days believe it or not, on the counter. And when they get to like peak pickle, and there's some variances to like how warm. And so it could take a week, could take a couple of weeks. Um, and then once they're at kind of peak pickle, meaning that they, they taste really where you want them to be, um, you move them into the refrigerator. And with the vinegar, the pickling solution and the combination of the cold temperature, they're going to last for months. Yeah, they're gonna, yeah. they're going to be pretty good. They eventually will start to get a little softer. They don't go bad, but they get a little softer. Um, but that's how you get like that, those really super crunchy pickles. It does require a good, you know, refrigerator space. You have to kind of commit yeah. to, to yeah. devoting some space to the fridge. Um, but that's how you get there. Okay. Um, now I made sauerkraut for my first time this year. Oh, cool. And um, I'm a little afraid to open it, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, I'm afraid that what it, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm afraid that it's going to be bad, not taste bad, but make us sick. It won't though. And here's the beautiful thing about fermentation. So a couple of things with fermentation is essentially you're a bacterial farmer. You're encouraging good bacteria to move into the food. And so as long as you're fermenting fruits and vegetables, okay, mm -hmm. keep in mind fruits and vegetables, the the acid produced by the good bacteria kills any bad bacteria. So the food will let you know if it is not right. You will get an off smell and you will get a gray color. You'll okay. see that. It'll be gray. It tells you it's not good. The only thing I caution against for people embarking on home fermentation projects are meats. Okay. So if you're trying to like do, you know, there's always usually, and usually it's a guy, sorry, dudes. <laughs> it's usually a guy who's like, I read a book. I'm going to make my own, you know, charcuterie now. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to make a ham. I'm, you know, I'm like, well, you know, take a lesson first. Okay. Right. Um, cause you've got a different category of pathogens that could really kill you. Um, but you shouldn't be afraid of your sauerkraut. Always check. It should smell kind of crowdy. Mm -hmm. You know, it should have that kind of v very acidy you know, distinct smell. Yeah. And it should be, you know, kind of, it has like a, the color will be like a pale greenish white mm -hmm. kind of color. But if it is like pure white, gray or brown, that's its signal. That's telling you it went bad. Okay. And do we have to worry about like, I know um, when I've made jellies and things in the past, um, they always, and or canned things from my garden, they always say about worrying about botulism. Sure. Now, botulism is why we, why we, meaning all the, the food preservers in the food safety community, we caution against botulism because you can't smell it, you can't taste it. Yeah. And so, and it, it is the one that could kill you. So that's, we're always cautious about that. But there's a couple things to keep in mind with botulism. Um, it needs a low acid environment. So very rarely will you see it in anything pickled. Okay. 
the acidity for jams and jellies is tweakable. And if you look at what we, you know, modern accepted scientifically proven recipes for jams and jellies, they always say to add like a tablespoon or two of lemon juice mm -hmm. to it. That's why okay. you want to increase the acidity of it. And just, just a tablespoon or two of lemon juice is enough to increase the acidity as well, uh, but not affect the taste. It doesn't make it sour. Um, and so by doing that, you're, you're using science to erect a barrier against a pathogen like botulism. Um, the one thing you do want to make sure you're doing is processing. Um, I still cringe when you see, as my grandma did it, of, you know, just pouring hot wax on a jar. Yeah. And that was state-of-the-art technology in the 1930s. Not I remember now. that. I remember having to pull the wax off of the top of her jars inside. Yeah. Yeah. But don't do that now. If you're making jams and jellies, either process them in a hot water bath canner. Mm -hmm. It's only like five to seven minutes, um, depending on you know exactly what you're making. Or you stick them in the fridge or the freezer. Mm -hmm. There's just no reason in today's world to, you know, invert jars or pour wax on them. You know, that's don't do that anymore. Okay. And I, not, not you, Jody, but no, I, mean, I know I got it. <laughs> nobody do that. Yeah. No, I actually, my, I, and maybe it's not even safe anymore. I know I get a little afraid to use it, but my grandmother had given me her pressure canner. It's probably from the fifties and sixties. Um, so I do, I am very careful with it, but, um, well, I usually do use that. You know, you don't have to pressure can, and, and that's a, it's the right tool for the job. Um, pre, you don't have to pressure can um, jams and jellies because, again, the acidity and the sugar. The only things for preservation that need to be pressure canned are items that are low in acid. Okay. So th those are items like, like meats. Okay, how about like green beans and things exactly. like that? Oh, okay. Green beans that are not acidified. So if you're making pickled dilly beans hot that goes in the hot water bath canner but if you're doing green beans in water or potatoes in water or carrots in water that is low acid and then you have to use the pressure canner and here's something else your extension service can do for you is my favorite pressure canners are about 60 70 years old mm -hmm. so there is as long as you keep your pressure canner in good condition you can use that thing forever the thing that'll go bad on a pressure canner is sometimes if you have a dial gauge that mm -hmm. reads out the pressure. And what you can do is you can call your extension service and your master food preserver will have a tester. And so you can get your dial gauge tested to make sure it's still reading the, same, the correct amount of pressure. And those are also easily replaceable. Okay. So even if you don't want to test it, if you feel like, you know what, I'm just going to get a new dial gauge. It's maybe like under 20 bucks. Yeah. And you, you can get a new dial gauge for an old canner. It's a universal fit. Now, can you tell on things like green beans or carrots or potatoes if when you open them, if they're not, shouldn't be eaten? Um, you know, again, botulism is the one that you can't smell or taste. Yeah. So one of the signs that something has gone bad is sometimes you'll see bulging. The lids will bulge up. That's usually a good signifier that something is wrong. If you see the color, when you take something like a green bean out of a pressure canner, that color of the bean, which is a little darker than a fresh green bean, will be the same a year after you've canned it. There should be no change. If all of a sudden, you know, they look gray or brown, that's a sign that something's gone wrong. And here's a little fun food history thing that goes along with it. Uh, just for botulism, it... What will kill you is the toxin, not the spore produced by the botulism. And so why we pressure can is that by using a pressurized environment, we can raise the temperature to above, you know, boiling to like mm -hmm. say 240 degrees, which will then kill the spore. Now, I, I get this a lot in classes and it's the old, well, my grandma didn't do it that way and we mm -hmm. all live. And here's the reason why people lived is we cooked food differently um that 70 years ago and that's we kind of alluded to this about eating raw foods yeah. um casseroles stews soups are long time uh long cooking times over heat do we boil our food and we, when we boiled our food it killed the toxins so theoretically you could and people did if they pr preserved something incorrectly and then ate it 
they were cooking it first. So the spore might be there, but the spore wasn't going to kill you. The toxin produced by the spore was going to kill you. So if you added those terribly canned, those incorrectly canned, those killer green beans to a soup or a stew, then boil the heck out of it, you just killed all the toxins. And that's how people lived with incorrect canning techniques. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. I'm so glad to hear this because now maybe I won't be afraid to eat that sauerkraut on New Year's Day, which is definitely a Lancaster County thing. Yeah, you do it. Do you, Don't be afraid of it. And that's why I'm... a. Uh, I'm always an advocate in my teaching and everything is if we understand why we're doing something again, the, the whys and how a food preservation technique or a food or anything kind of how the history of it, how it came about, we feel more confident when we're making it and we're eating it. Yeah. Very good. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. And I really, I'm going to go out and get your other book, Preservation, the Art and Science of Canning, Fermentation, and Dehydration. Woo, that's a lot of words. It and, is. <laughs> that, you know, that's modern publishing. You need a lot of words to for right. the um, for the search engines. That's true. That's true. And then, of course, the new one. Now, did this come out yet? or? The official publication date is January 29th. Okay. American Advertising Cookbooks, How Corporations Taught Us to Love Bananas, Spam, and Jello. Please go out and get this book. If, you're, if you love history, if you love food, and just love the advertising that we all see everywhere, make sure you pick up this book. It's a great read. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and also check out Christina Ward. Her website is christinaward.net. And are you going to be anywhere where they can see you, maybe up there in Wisconsin? Well, I have a reading in Milwaukee on February 3rd, and I'm working on a small, like a slight tour um, throughout the late winter and spring. And so I'll keep up to date on my website um, as to where I may pop up. Um, so I'm hoping to get out. I have friends in Lancaster, oh. so I'm, uh, so I'm hoping that maybe, you know, it'll be my combination book tour, see my friends tour. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, definitely let me know. And then I'll put it on my website as well. And I'll let everybody know on the podcast. Great. Thank you so much for asking such great questions. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to, to talk about, um, you know, my, my strange obsessions with food. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's funny because as I'm reading more about you, the more I'm like, oh, wow, she's really into the same kind of things that I, I like to do. <laughs> uh, so it's nice to see someone else in this world is as crazy as me. That's weirdos stick together. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you so much. And um, I hope to see you soon. So make sure you let me know when you're in Lancaster. I will do. Thank you so much. I want to thank Christina Ward for joining me today and speaking about her books, American Advertising Cookbooks, How Corporations Taught Us to Love Spam, Bananas, and Jello, as well as Preservation, The Art and Science of Canning, Fermentation, and Dehydration, and for giving me those tips. Hopefully I can make my pickles perfect next time. I also want to thank you for joining me on Love You a Brunch. And make sure you subscribe to us if you're listening to us on iTunes or wherever you listen to us so that other foodies can find us. That's how we get the word out. Please join me next time when I speak to Colleen Kennedy about her book, Kid Chef Every Day. Make sure to look for us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or the website loveyouabrunchpodcast.com. Or you can email at loveyouabrunchpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much and see you next time on Love You A Brunch. <laughs>